So today I want to look at two kinds of games and then change topic a bit. And the games I want to look at are about ultimatums and bargaining. And we'll start with ultimatums and we'll move smoothly through. And we'll see why that's an easy transition in a while. All right, so the game we're going to play involves two players. Um, there's two players. Whoops, one and two. And the game is this. Player one is going to make a take it or leave it offer. Take it or leave it offer to player two. And this offer is going to concern uh, a pie. And let's make the pie worth one dollar for now. All right, we'll, we'll probably play this for real in a bit. So we'll play it for one dollar. All right? So it's a split of a pie. We can think of the split as offering S to player one and one minus S to player two. All right, S to player one and one minus S to player two. And player two has two choices. Two can accept this offer. And if two accepts the offer, then the shares are, then they get exactly the offer. Player one gets S and player two gets one minus S. All right, alternatively, player two or player two can reject. And if player two rejects the offer, then both players get zero. Both players get nothing. All right, so a very simple game. There's a dollar on the table. I'll take it out in a minute. There's a dollar on the table. All right, and our two players are going to bargain for this, but it isn't much of a bargain. Play, player one's basically going to announce what the division's going to be. Two can either accept that division or no one gets anything. All right? Everyone understand the game? So I thought we'd start off by playing this game for real a couple of times. Um, so why don't I come down and do that? All right. So why don't we play with some people in this row? I've been playing with that row all the time. So uh, Ali's going to help me find somebody. I found someone. You found somebody. OK. <laughs> so uh, the person behind you? Yeah. And your name is? Ikia. Ikia. You have to shout out to people. This, this doesn't make a noise. Shout. Ikia. 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 Thank you. Ikia. And uh, so you'll be player one. And player two uh, will be this gentleman here, whose name is, shout out. Noah. Noah, OK. So Ikia, do you know each other? No. That's, OK, OK. So uh, uh, Aquia can make any offer she wants. We'll play this for, for real money, all right? So there's a real dollar at stake. You can make any offer you want. It can be in fractions of pennies, if you like, uh, of the amount of dollar that you're going to offer to Noah, no, mm -hmm. to Noah, and the amount you're going to keep yourself. There you go. Um, a penny. Sh sh shout it out so everyone can hear. But you sta stand up, stand up. So this is, your, this is your moment in the lights, all right? Can you stand up as well? Here we go. I'm going to offer him a penny. You're going to offer him a penny. And, and Noah, are you going to take a penny? No. Noah's not going to take a penny. So, but everyone, so I didn't lose any money on that. So no one, no one made any money. I didn't lose any money. That seems pretty good. Let's try a different couple. Let's move, move, let's move, uh, move uh, around the room a little bit. So uh, why don't you, um, uh, Ali, why don't you take the guy behind here, whose name is, shout out. Gary. Gary. All right, so Gary, why don't you stand up? And... We'll let Gary play with uh, the gentleman in here. What's, the, what's your name in here? Uh, Anish. Anish. Yeah. All right, stand up. Anish. Do you know each other? Yeah. All right, so what do, we make, what, what do we let Anish be player one this time? You understand the rule of the game? Yeah. So make your offer. 30 cents. Which is that? You're, you're, I'll, I'll offer him 30 cents. He, offering him 30 cents. No, that's OK. He's saying, he's saying no as well, OK? OK, so we're not, we're not. All right, let's raise the stakes a bit. Let's, 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 let's make it $10, all right? So we're not getting much acceptance here. Let me try a third couple, all right, working my way back. So how about you? Uh, what's your name? Courtney. So when, when you stand up as well, we'll let Courtney be player one. And actually, well, Ali, why don't you sit down so I can, I can do it from here? And you, and you are? Danny. Danny, all right. So Courtney's going to be player one, and Danny's going to be player two. These weren't our dating couple from earlier, right? We're, we're safe from that. OK, good. All right, so, so Courtney, what are you going to offer? Um, $5. $5, which is half of the $10? Uh, accept. All right, accept. All right, all right, all right. So it turned out in this game 
that a lot of people are rejecting offers. Let's have a look at it on the board a second. Let's think about it a second. And we'll come back. We're not, done with, we're not done with this couple. We're not done with any of you couples. We're going to come back to you. All right? So in this, in this game, it has a pretty, it, we, it's pretty simple to analyze this game by backward induction. Right? By backward induction, we're going to start with the receiver of the offer. And the receiver of the offer is choosing between the offer made to them, which was, which is in our notation is one minus s, and in our three examples, that was the penny, then it was 30 cents, and then it was half of it, so call it 50 cents to be consistent. All right? And we actually saw two of those offers rejected, but according to backward induction, assuming people are trying to maximize their dollar payoffs here, what should we see the, the what, what should we see the receiver do? They should accept, right? They should accept even the somewhat insulting offer of a penny that was made, even that somewhat insulting offer should be accepted uh, by, uh, by Noah, right? So Noah didn't accept the offer of a penny, and let's come back over there. So Noah didn't accept the offer of a penny, and uh, uh, I forget who it was, but, the, but our second player didn't accept an offer of 30 cents, but we've just argued they should have been accepted. They should have been accepted. In fact, when uh, Aquia made the offer of, of one penny to Noah, I think she assumed that Noah would accept it. Is this right? Why do you think Noah was going to accept it? Shout out. Because I felt you'd be better off with a penny than nothing. You thought you'd be better off with a penny than nothing, all right? All right, and then when you saw an offer, the offer came up a bit, who was my second offerer? Here, we, here was my second offerer. Uh, you, you offered a bit more. Why didn't you offer more? Um, I felt 30 was a pretty fair share. It's a lot better than nothing. All right, 30 seems better than nothing, although not necessarily fair, but it's a, it's a little better than nothing. All right, and wh wh where was my rejecter of the second offer? Who rejected the second offer? Why did you reject 30 cents? It's just a pride thing. It's a pride thing. It's a pride <laughs> thing. All right, and pretty soon we converged onto, onto 50 cents, which notice is nowhere near backward induction. It's nowhere near backward induction. So the third offer, which is Courtney, is that right? Why did you offer, uh, what was it, half of it? Because half is better for me than nothing. Half is better than you for nothing, and you figured he's gonna, he's gonna reject otherwise, and in fact he didn't reject. Why didn't you reject? Because five is better than nothing. Five is better than nothing. But, that, but the five is better than nothing argument would have argued against making any rejection in this game. Is that right? Right? So here's a game where backward induction is giving a very clear prediction. The clear prediction is, first of all, the second player will accept whatever's given to them. And second, given that, the first player should offer them essentially nothing, should offer them just a penny. Right? So backward induction predicts, backward induction predicts that the offer will be essentially, let's say, 99 cents and one cent or even, or even you know, virtually a dollar and nothing. All right? But in fact, we don't get that. We get a lot of rejection of these low offers, and often we get offers made much, much higher in the vicinity of half. All right? Now, why? Why are we seeing a failure of backward induction in this game? I think this is, a, this is not just you guys. It's a very reliable result uh, in experimental data. <coughs> All right, so why, why do we see so many people in this ultimatum game both offer more and, more importantly, reject less than uh, a small amount? All right, so let's talk about it. So, so uh, one person said it's a pride thing. It's a pride thing. Uh, where was that? Let's, let's try the other aisle while I'm here. So uh, what's, the, what's the smallest offer you would have accepted? What's your name, first of all? Uh, Jeff. Um, I don't know, consent. Ascent, right? So there are some backward induction players in the room. All right, all right. Who who would have who, who would have rejected a cent? Who would have rejected ten cents? Should be going. We should be going down at least. Who would have rejected thirty cents? Few people rejected thirty cents. Not many actually. All right. How many people would have rejected fifty cents? One person even would have rejected fifty cents, right? But but essentially no one. Okay. Okay. So what's what's happening here? Why, why do people think people are rejecting? What is essentially money from my pocket, right? There's nothing going on here. I'm just giving you money. Why are they rejecting being given money? Um, like overall, the stakes are really low. So if you have any value on sort of like pride, what people said, you know, it's it's not worth a penny or all right. Ten cents. All right. So it may be pride going on here. So certainly one thing is about pride. It turns out that people do this even in quite high stakes games. But you're right. Certainly that trade off is going to start to bite. All right. What else is going on? So I agree. Pride is part of what's going on. What else is going on here? Let's try and get some conversation going. Is there somebody in here? I can get the mic in. Shout out your name and really shout. Peter. Yeah, go on. <laughs> uh, change is cumbersome. 
Change is cumbersome. Okay, you didn't want the change. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. But if the stakes go up, that would get rid of that. Yeah. Um, maybe people are tying their own outcomes to the other players' outcomes as well. Right, so maybe people have different payoffs here. Maybe people, people are comparing their payoff to the other person's payoff. That certainly seems like a plausible thing to be going on here. You might feel uh, less happy about getting 20 cents knowing the other person's getting 80 cents, for example. You might be trying to teach them a lesson to get them to offer more. Right, you might be trying to set a sort of moral standard here. All right, so there's some notions of indignation or even teaching people that they really should offer people more. All right, what else could be going on here? If people know I'm not going to accept less than 50 cents, then they should give me 50 cents by backwarding them. Right, so, so part of what's going on here, actually this game was a one-shot game, right? We just played it once, and we could have played it, in fact, they often do play this, this this way in the lab, you could have played it without anybody knowing who the other player was, all right? But particularly in this sitting where everyone can see everyone else, and even in the lab where people uh, actually can't see people, but they might imagine that the game is really repeated, you could imagine people trying to establish a reputation. Is that right? So there's lots of these reasons. There's sort of moral indignation reasons or teaching a lesson reasons, pride reasons. There's also this basic reason that people might be thinking this game is, I, I should play this game as I would a similar situation in life where I might want to be establishing reputation. Right? So there's a certain amount of confusion going on in the game, but there's also a certain amount of, of, of a lot of things make sense. Now notice that once we've established that people are going to reject small offers in this game, once we've established people are going to reject small offers, it makes perfectly good sense to offer a lot more than, than, than nothing. All right? So it's, it's not that surprising that once we've established the idea that people are going to reject small offers, you're going to see people uh, making offers that are reasonably large, although not usually larger than 50 cents. Why is 50 cents so focal here? Why is 50 cents so focal? It's not a trick question, I'm just asking, you know, why do people think 50 cents is so focal? Why do, you know, I think it's typical that people end up offering around 50 cents. Why? It sounds fair, right? It seems fair. There's some notion of fairness. It's not clear, by the way, what ethical principle is involved here, right? It's not clear that if you're walking along the street and you happen to find a dollar at your feet, that you should pick it up, and anyone else you happen to see at that moment, you should give 50 cents to. Right? That's essentially what the situation is. I mean, you, you just chanced upon this dollar that I just gave you. It isn't clear that there's any particularly great moral claim to give it to someone else, but I think people read this as a situation about splitting a, splitting a cake, cake in an environment of, of distributional justice. They view it as a larger picture. Is that right? So it turns out there's a large literature on this. There's a large experimental literature on the ultimatum game, and there's an even larger literature on an even simpler game in which I give people a dollar, I say you can give whatever share you want to the other person, and they don't even get a chance to accept or reject. Right? That's called the dictator game. Right? The dictator game, literally, you're just simply given a dollar and you can give whatever share you want to the other person. Right? It turns out even in the dictator game, people give quite a lot of money. Right? That suggests that there really is some notion of fairness or some notion of, of distributional justice going on in people's heads here, rightly or wrongly. All right? So one thing that should tell us is even in extremely simple games, extremely simple games, we should be a little bit careful about reading backward induction into what's going to happen in the real world. And part of this is because, as you mentioned, the very first day of the class, people care about other things than just the obvious payoffs. And part of it is about more complicated things like reputation and so on. All right, having said that, let's nevertheless, for the, for the purpose of, of today, uh, act as if we are going to do backward induction, and let's embed this into a slightly more complicated game. All right, so the more complicated game is as follows. All right, so we're going to have a two-period bargaining game. Two-period bargaining. In this two-period bargaining game, the beginning of the game is exactly the same. So there's a dollar on the table, and player one makes an offer to two. And once again, we can call this offer S and one minus S, just the same as before. And just as before, player two can accept the offer. And if they accept the offer, then this is indeed what they get. All right, but now, 
if two rejects, which is two's other alternative, if player two rejects the offer, then we flip the roles. We play the game again, but we flip the roles. So we go to stage two, right? So this is everything we've said up, up here is stage one. And down here we go to stage two. And in stage two, player two gets to make an offer to one. Player two gets to make an offer to one. And once again, we can <coughs> call this, uh, we better be careful. Let's put, let's put ones here just to indicate we're in the first round and uh, twos here to indicate we're in the second. All right, so we make offers S2 and one minus S2, where S2, S, S2 is, the, is, the, is that that goes to player one, and one minus S2 is that, is that that goes to player uh, two. So two gets to make an offer to player one, and now one can accept or reject. If she accepts, then she gets her share from here. The offer is accepted. And if she rejects, then we get nothing. All right, so this game is exactly the same as playing the previous game, except we flip roles. But we're going to add one catch. The catch is this. In the first round, the money on the table is a dollar. All right? But if we end up going into the second round, right, so the first offer is not accepted, and we go into the second round, then part of the money is lost. And in particular, we'll assume that the, the money on the table is delta. Right? Where you can think of delta as being just some number less than one. Right? So if you want a concrete example, think of this as being 90 cents. So the idea here is, if you get into the second round, time has passed, it's costly, and so money in the second round uh, is, uh, I think of it as money in the second round as being worthless, or you could actually think of this cake being eaten up, some of it's thrown away, some of it's wasted. All right, everyone understand the game? All right, so this is very similar to the previous game, but we've got this second stage coming in, and we've got discounting. So this is the idea of discounting. How many of you have heard the term discounting before? All right. So you probably saw it in a finance class or a macro class where we think about there being a value of money, uh, sorry, value of time. That money today is worth more than money tomorrow, partly because you could put the money today into the bank and it could earn interest, partly because you're simply impatient to get that money and go and have lunch, particularly on the day <coughs> in which the clock's changed. All right. Okay. So let's try this game again. Uh, and let's just, let's just play it for real. So let's come down again. Right, everyone understand the game? Basically the same rules except with this flipping around and with the possibility that the cake may shrink. Let's see what people have learned. So who are our first pair? Our first pair were Aquia and who was Aquia's? And Noah, all right? So uh, Aquia, what, what, uh, what are you gonna offer? You're player one here, all right? But if your offer is rejected, Noah's gonna get to make an offer to you. All right, so what are you gonna offer this time? 45.99. Uh, uh, so 45 cents, yeah, 45 for, cents, for, 40, oh, 46. For, 46, okay, so he, he gets 46 if he accepts the offer, is that right? Yeah. 40, 46 if he accepts the offer, all right? He that. He accepts that, okay, that was easy, that was easy. So that was, so, so Aquia got, uh, got 54 cents and uh, Noah got uh, 46 cents, all right? Who was our second pair? Who was our second pair? So that was, uh, I forgot, an, uh, Anish, right? And, uh, and Gary, all right, so Anish, what are you gonna offer uh, this time? I'll offer 43. 43, you're gonna push the envelope a little bit. All right. All right, that one got accepted as well. Okay, so people are, people are converging here. All right, and what about our third off, uh, offer and receiver? It was Courtney and Danny. And Danny, so Courtney? 30. 30, uh, so it's 30 for him. Uh, I'll accept. Oh, three acceptances, all right? All right. Let's find out something here. So I was hoping to, to get into the second round. So supposing, uh, okay, so you accepted, that's fine. That's fine, all right? Well, no, 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 no chicken sounds around the room, all right? All right, so uh, it's Danny, right? Yeah. So Danny, had you rejected, I mean, you accepted, but had you accepted, what would you have offered in the second round? Uh, 45. 
45, all right, 45. And would you have accepted that in the second round if your 30 had been accepted? Yes. Yeah, so you, okay, so you might have been, you might have done better, it turns out, all right? All right, let's go back through the, see the other rejections, so the, uh, so the other acceptances. So uh, my second couple, you offered 43, is that right? Right, and you said yes to 43, is that right? Had you rejected 43, what would you have offered back in return? 43. 43, the same thing back. Would, would, you, would you have accepted it? Uh, he gets a 47. He would have got 47 in that case? Uh, yeah, you'd, you'd accepted that, okay, okay. And Aquia went first and she offered 45 to Noah. And Noah, had in fact you rejected, what would you have offered back? I would have also done 45. Same back. thing back. And would, would, you, would you have accepted it? Yeah. Okay, so, it's, so we can see here that the decision to accept or reject partly depends on what you think the other side is going to do in the second round. Is that right? So here you are, you're making, if you're, if you're in the middle of this game, if you're a player two, you've received an offer, right? None of these offers sounded crazy. I mean, 30 cents was the lowest one, but none of them sounded crazy. And you're trying to decide whether you should accept or reject this offer. And one thing you should have in mind is, what would I offer if, it, if I reject? And will that offer that I then offer in the next round be accepted or rejected? Is that right? right? And so if we just work backwards, we can see what you should offer in the first round should be just enough to make sure it's accepted, knowing that the person who's, who's receiving the offer in the first round is going to think about the offer they're going to make in the second round and going to think about whether you're going to accept or reject in the second round. Is that right? Right? So that sounds like a bit of a mouthful, but that mouthful of reasoning is exactly backward induction. Right? It's exactly backward induction. It's saying to figure out what I should do in the first round, I need to figure out what I should offer in the first round. I need to figure out whether player two is going to accept or reject. And to figure out whether he or she is going to accept or reject, I have to put myself in his or her shoes and figure out what he or she would offer if she did reject and what he or th she thinks I would do if I got that second round offer. Is that right? All right. So let's try and analyze this as if backward induction was going to work here, as if we didn't have to worry about things like pride here. All right. So this is the game we're actually playing, so let's, let's keep that one. And actually analyze it on the board. I want to walk us from a relatively mundane game of take it or leave it offers to a more complicated game in which there could be several rounds of offers. But we're going to go slowly, so we'll start this with two rounds. All right? So first of all, let's just look at the stage one game. The stage one game, and let's keep in track what the offer is and what the receiver is. This, this is the offerer, and this is the receiver. All right? And in the one stage game, the game only has one stage, then we know from backward induction what the result should be. It isn't what we find in the, in the lab, it isn't what we find in the classroom, but we know what we should get. The offerer should offer to keep everything, essentially, or maybe 99 cents, but let's call it one, and the receiver gets nothing. Right? So again, I'm approximating a little bit because it could be 99 cents and a penny, but who cares? Let's just call it a dollar and nothing if it's a one-stage game. All right? So now let's consider a two-stage game. All right? In the two-stage game, the person who's making the offer in the first stage needs to look forward, anticipate what would happen if, the off if, if her offer was rejected by player two and player two went forward into the second stage. Is that right? So in the two-stage game, in the first stage of the two-stage game, the person making the offer wants to anticipate what the receiver would offer in the second round were the receiver to reject her offer. Okay. So, but we can, we can do that by backward induction. We know that in the second round, if the receiver rejects the offer, then the second round of the two-stage game is what? It's a one-stage game. All right? And we've just argued, that at, least, at, least we predict, at, least, at least we believe in backward induction, in that case, player two, who is then the offerer, will offer a dollar, and player one, who is now the receiver, will accept it and get nothing. All right? So player one in the first round of the two-stage game wants to make an offer that's just enough to get player two to accept it now. All right? 
So let's think about this. So if player one offers two something more than what? More than, well, tomorrow player two can get a dollar, all right? But that's a dollar tomorrow, all right? So a dollar tomorrow is worth how much today if we're discounting? It's just worth delta, right? It's just worth delta. So if player one uh, offers player two more than delta times one, which is what player two can get tomorrow, then two will accept. And if player one offers two less than delta times a dollar, because you can get a dollar tomorrow, but that's only worth delta, uh, that dollar tomorrow is worth uh, just delta today, then two will reject. All right? So the offer has to be exactly enough to get accepted, which is exactly delta dollars. All right? Delta dollars. All right? So player two knows that she can get, let's put it in pink, player two knows she can get a dollar tomorrow, so you need to offer her at least delta today to make it as good for her as getting a dollar tomorrow. All right, so we know the receiver must be offered at least delta tomorrow, which means the offerer is going to keep one minus delta. All right, so this, in, the two in the first round of the two-stage game, Player one should offer one, mi uh, one minus delta to for herself and delta for player two. And player two should accept that because delta dollars today is as good as one dollar tomorrow. All right. Now another way to see that is in a picture. So let's just draw a picture. All right, let's put the uh, payoff of player one here and the payoff of player two on this axis. All right, and these are, we're, we're gonna assume they're just gonna maximize dollars, so there's no pride in here. And if we just look at the one stage game, we're simply looking at this line. All right, the offers in the one stage game, it could be that player one uh, gets everything herself and gives nothing to player two. It could be that player two keeps everything, for, uh, get, end up getting everything and player one gets nothing, and it could be any combination in between. Right? And we argued by backward induction, although not in reality, in backward induction, in the real, uh, in backward induction, in the one-stage game, player one uh, 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 makes an offer to player two, which is kind of an insulting offer. Player one says, "I get everything, and you get a penny." All right. So this is the one-stage game. In the two-stage game. Instead of, in, in the, in the two-stage game, if things are settled in the first stage, this line represents the possible divisions between player one and player two, all right? But if we end up going into the second stage, the pie is shrunk. The pie is shrunk, instead of, being, instead of going from one to one, it goes from delta one to delta one. Or it's like, if delta's 0.9, it goes from 0.9 to 0.9. So let's draw that line in. Right, so we get into the second stage, we'll end up being here. Right? And this goes from delta dollars here to delta dollars here, where these dollars, these dollars are being evaluated at time, at, at, at time one. Right? So the pi has shrunk. If we get into the second stage, then by backward induction, player two knows, player two is in an ultimatum game, player two will be making the offer, and player two says, whatever cake is left, I'm going to take all of it, and you're just going to get a penny. So if we get into the second stage, then player two will make this offer to player one. All right, player two will say, I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep all of the, all, the whole of the pie, which in time, time uh, which in, the, in first period dollars is worth delta. So I'm going, to get, I'm going to end up with a payoff of delta, and you're going to end up with a payoff of essentially nothing. All right? Player two knows, player two knows that they can therefore get at least delta dollars or delta, delta in, in current day dollars worth from, say, from rejecting your offer. Since they can get at least, del, at least delta current day offers from rejecting your offer, the lowest offer you can make to them is an offer that gives them at least delta. So the offer you're going to make is this offer. This is the two-stage offer. 
It happens in the first stage. Player one gives, makes an offer that gives player two what player two could get in the second round, and gives player two delta, and keeps one minus delta for herself. All right, everyone understand the picture? So this picture is just corresponding to this table. All right? The thing people tend to get confused about here, I think, is they get confused between current dollars and, uh, and uh, discounted dollars. So we're gonna do all the analysis here in terms of uh, the first period dollars. Dollars tomorrow are going to be worth delta. There's a hand up. Can I can I get a shout a shouting out? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Sorry. I need to put those labels in. Yeah. So this is the outcome. If it was a one-stage game, and this is the outcome. If it was a a two-stage game, right? The offer's made and accepted. All right. Let's roll it forward. Let's look at a three-stage game. Let's keep this picture handy and think about a three-stage game. So the first, the beginning of the game is the same. All right, we're going to look at three-stage bargaining. And the rules in three-stage bargaining are pretty much the same as in two-stage bargaining, but now there's two possible flips. In three-stage bargaining, In three-stage bargaining, in the first period, in period one, one makes the offer. And if it's accepted, the game's over. All right? In period two, so if we reject, if we reject, then we go to period two, when two makes the offer. And if it's rejected now, this time by player one, then we go to period three, where once again, one makes the offer. So you can see where we're heading. We're heading towards an alternate, an alternate offer bargaining model. I'm gonna make an offer, Jake's gonna either accept or reject, and he'll make an offer, and we'll flip to and fro. There's a question, let me try and get a mic out to the question. Here we go. Delta Sh shout is, out so people can hear. Is, if delta is the best that player two can get tomorrow, then why wouldn't you wouldn't one offer player two delta discounted by delta today? Uh, good, good, good. Okay, right. So, good. So, so I think I was confusing about it. Something behind me clear. So tomorrow, player two can get everything, everything that there is. All right. So whatever whatever pie is left tomorrow, player two can get all of it. All right. So call that pie tomorrow one and evaluated in current, in, in period one dollars as being worth delta. All right, all right, that, 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 does that make sense? Okay, so I, I, I think I, I misspoke on that, so let me say it again. All right, so, so every period there's this pie, all right, in every period, if it was the last period of the game, the person making the offer is gonna get the whole pie, all right? But if I view that pie tomorrow from today, right, a pie of one dollar tomorrow is only worth delta dollars today. A pie of one dollars the day after tomorrow is only worth delta dollars tomorrow and delta squared dollars today, and so on. All right, so that, that, that's, that's the way in which we're gonna do discounting here. Good, all right. all right. All right, so in this game, if one makes an offer, if it's accepted, it's over. If it's accepted, then we're done. And if this offer's accepted, then we're done. And if this offer's accepted, then we're done. And in the third round, if it's rejected, then both players get nothing. All right? And once again, we're going to assume, we're going to assume that the players are discounting. So what does, it mean? what does it mean to say they're discounting? It means that dollars in period one are worth dollars, dollars in period two are, are discounted by delta, and dollars in period three are discounted by delta times delta, or if you like, by delta squared. All right, let's put this in, into, real, in, into real notions of money. If you think of delta as being 90%, then a dollar in period one is worth a dollar. A dollar in period two, viewed from period one, is worth 90 cents. And a dollar in period three, viewed from period one, is worth 81 cents. All right? Okay, so what do we think is gonna happen here? Well, once again, we can do backward induction. Here 
here we are in our picture. Let's look at the three-stage game. And once again, when we analyze, as always, when we analyze these games using backward induction, we want to start at the end. If we start at the end, we know that the last stage, that's the third stage of the three-stage game, looks like what? It looks like the one-stage game. And in the one-stage game, we know the offerer will get everything. All right? So again, so the last stage of the three-stage game, we know the person who makes the offer, who this time will be player one, will get everything. However, that everything is only worth delta in, two, in, in period two dollars, and it's only worth delta squared in period one, off, uh, in period one dollars. All right? So, in period, in period one, uh, sorry, in, in the first period of this game, we know that if the offer is rejected, we know what's going to happen. So it again, in the first period of this three-stage game, if the offer is rejected, then we'll go into a two-stage game, right? We'll go to a two-stage game, and we already know what happens in a two-stage game. In a two-stage game, the person who gets to make an offer gets one minus delta, and the person who receives the offer gets delta. All right? So we know in the first stage of the game that the person who receives the offer always has the outside option of saying, no, I reject, and we know that that person tomorrow will get one minus delta. But one minus delta tomorrow is worth how much today? It's worth delta one minus, it, it, uh, tomorrow they're gonna get one minus delta dollars, so today that's worth delta one minus delta dollars, all right? So the offer I have to make in the first round to make sure that the other person accepts it has to be just better in discounted dollars than what they're going to get tomorrow. They're going to get one minus delta tomorrow, so I have to give them delta one minus delta today. All right, which means I keep for myself one minus delta one minus delta. And if you don't like the algebra, let's look at the picture. In the picture, in the one stage game, this is the offer. In the two-stage game, we know if we get into the second round, player two gets everything, right? So we have to give him that much today. And if we get into the third round, now we're looking at delta squared here and delta squared here. Delta squared and delta squared. We know that if we get into the third round, the person who makes the offer in the third round will get, to, to get, uh, get everything. So we can actually uh, work our way uh, along, all right? So in the, in the third round, the person who makes the third offer will get everything. So in the second round, you'd have to give them that much. So in the first round, you'd have to give player two that much. All right, say it again. In period three, the person making the offer can get, get everything, all right? So in period two, they must be getting uh, delta times that. So in period one, you have to give them at least this much. Right, and this here is the offer you'd make in the three-stage game. All right. So in the picture, it's, it, we're just going, doing a little zigzag on the uh, on the on the uh, chart. We're also always working across the diagonal. All right. So we've done the f we've done the one-stage game. The one-stage game, the person making the offer gets everything. In the two-stage game, the person making the offer offers just, a much, just enough to get the offer accepted, which is delta, because that's what, that's what a dollar's worth tomorrow. In the three-stage game, the person making the offer makes just enough to get the offer accepted, which is delta times what the receiver would get tomorrow. What they get tomorrow is one minus delta, so they get delta one minus delta today. All right? How about the four-stage game? Let's see if we can do that. So if we go to the four-stage game now, in the four-stage game, if the person receiving the offer rejects the offer, then tomorrow they can get one minus delta, one minus delta. So I need to offer them enough now in current dollars so, that ex so, they, so they will prefer that to getting one minus delta, one minus delta tomorrow. So how much must I offer them? I have to offer them at least delta times that much. So I have to offer them delta 
times 1 minus delta times 1 minus delta. Like this. Right, and again, I have to keep the rest, I'll, I'll keep the rest for myself. So I'll get 1 minus delta, 1 minus delta, 1 minus delta. All right? And so the principle is always give people just enough today so they'll accept the offer. And just enough today is whatever they'd get tomorrow discounted by delta. So actually, this backward induction isn't so bad. All right? What makes it a little bit easier is you don't actually, when, it, when you go through an extra stage of this, you don't actually have to go all the way to the beginning. You can actually start where you were last time and just discount <coughs> once more by delta. All right? Now let's, have a, let's see if we can see any kind of pattern emerging in this algebra. All right? So let's just multiply out these brackets. In the, in the four-stage game, this thing is actually equal to, just multiplying through, it's 1 minus delta plus delta squared uh, minus delta cubed. I hope it is, anyway. That's what this is. And this thing is equal to delta, delta minus delta squared uh, plus delta cubed. All right, just multiplying out the brackets. All right. Does anyone see a pattern emerging here in these offers? We had offers of 1 and then 1 minus delta. We could also multiply out this one. It might be helpful to do so. This is actually 1 minus delta plus, uh, uh, this is 1 minus delta uh, plus delta squared. All right. Anyone see a pattern? What these offers look like? They kind of alternate, right? So let's let's uh, let's have a look what the rather than do every stage. Should I do one more stage to see if we can see a pattern emerging, or should I just should I jump straight to ten stages and see what happens? Go straight to 10, you'll say? Let's do one, I don't know, let's do one, uh, okay, let's jump straight to 10. I mean, so, so imagine that this game actually had 10 rounds. All right, so this is the 10 stage game. And let's just, let's just continue our chart down here. So here's, the, here, need a bit more space here. All right, 10 stages. 10 stage game. I'm going to continue my chart, and my chart says, in the 10-stage game, what am I going to get? So the offer, the offer is going to be, it's going to be the same pattern, 1 minus delta plus delta squared minus delta cubed, dot, 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 uh, plus delta to the 8 minus delta to the 9. Everyone see that? And all I'm doing is I'm uh, continuing the pattern from above. Right, so if I have 10 stages, I always start with a 1. The positive and negative ter terms just alternate, and I have as many terms as 1 minus the stage I'm in. So in the 4-stage game, I ended up at delta cubed. So in the 10-stage game, I'll end up at delta to the 9. All right, everyone happy with that? All right, so the 4-stage offer is this slightly ugly thing. 1 minus delta plus delta squared minus delta cubed, dot, 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 dot. All right, so plus delta to the 4 minus delta to the 5, et cetera, et cetera, plus delta 8 minus delta 9. All right, that's a pretty ugly thing, but fortunately, some point in high school, you learned how to sum that thing. Do you remember, how, do you remember what this is? What do you call objects like this in high school? Anyone remember? Objects like 1, delta, delta squared, delta cubed, delta the 4, what are they called? They're called geometric series, right? They're called geometric series. Anyone remember how to sum them? We know that S is equal to this. Right, this is what the offer is. In the, if there's 10 rounds, we know the offer is accepted. 
All right, so the way, the way to remember how to sum it is to, the trick for summing it is to multiply both sides of this equation by, by the common ratio. To multiply both sides by delta. So if I multiply this side by delta, I'm going to multiply the other side by delta, and this one will become a delta. This delta, this delta will become a delta squared. This delta squared will become a delta cubed. This delta cubed will become a delta to the fourth, dot, dot, dot. There will be a minus delta to the eighth coming from the seventh term. There will be a plus delta to the nine coming from the delta eighth term. And there will be a minus delta to the tenth. All right, everyone okay with that? I just multiplied everything through by delta, and I just shifted the long one for convenience. What do I do now? Anyone remember? Add the two lines together. Let's add the two lines together. All right, so by summing on this side, I get 1 plus delta S10. All right, on the other side, what's kind of convenient is everything cancels. The 1 comes through, I get a 1. But these two terms cancel, and these two terms cancel, and these two terms cancel, and so on and so on, all the way up to the end, where I get minus delta to the 10. So we're okay, all the other terms have canceled out. All right, so now just uh, sorting out my algebra bit, I'm gonna take it on the other side, I'm gonna have that the offer you make, the offer you, this is what you're gonna get to keep, so the amount, the amount, the amount I claim I should keep in the first round is 1 minus delta to the 10 over 1 plus delta. I should be a little bit careful about the notation here because it may be a little bit confusing. The 10 here doesn't mean to the 10th power. It's just the offer in the 10th round, whereas the 10th here really does mean in the 10th power. OK? All right, so in the, in, if, we, if we play this game for 10 rounds, the offer you'd make would be 1 minus delta to the 10 over 1 plus delta, which means that the amount you're offering to the other side, which is 1 minus s, would be delta plus delta to the 10 over 1 plus delta. All right? So to summarize where we are, we started off by considering a very simple game, a one-stage take-it-or-leave-it offer. We know that in that take-it-or-leave-it offer, player one is going to claim everything for herself and offer nothing to player two. Then we considered a two-stage game, which was the same as the one-stage game, except that if player two <coughs> rejects the offer, he, let's call player two he, he gets to make an offer to player one in the second period. We know that in the second period of that two-stage game, player two can keep everything for himself. Everything for himself tomorrow is worth delta today. So you have to offer him at least delta today and keep one minus delta for yourself. Then we looked at a three-stage game. In this three-stage game, if player two rejects in the first round, player two can make you an offer in the second round, but now if you're player one and you reject in the second round, you get to make an offer to player two in the third round. We argued that in the second round of this game, the person, if player two rejects you in the first round and makes an offer in the second round, it'll be in a two-stage game, and they'll be able to keep one minus delta of the pi for themselves. So you have to offer them at least delta times 1 minus delta today for them to accept the offer, keeping the rest for yourself. Then we looked at a four-stage game. In the four-stage game, if player two rejects your offer, he can make you an offer, but if you can reject the offer, you can make him an offer, but if he rejects that offer, he can make you an offer. And once again, we asked, how much do I have to offer player two now for him to accept the offer now? He knows that if he rejects the offer, he can get this amount, 1 minus delta times 1 minus delta, tomorrow, so I have to offer him delta times that today, and once again, I keep the same for myself. Right? That's just a summary of what we did, and then what we did was we cheated, we jumped to the 10th stage, just noticing that a pattern had emerged, and we found in the 10th stage, 
This is the offer you'd make, just according to the same pattern, and it was this horrible thing. And then we used a little bit of high school math to simplify this thing, and it turns out this is the amount you'll keep for yourself, and this is the offer you'll make to play it to. All right, in each case, they'll be accepted. Did I make a math mistake? Thank you, yes, let's, make, let's put a C for script in here. Good. All right, so what do, what do we observe here? So the first thing to observe is in the one stage game, if we believe, it, if we believe backward induction, you certainly want to be the person making the offer. In the one stage game, in the ultimatum game, there's a huge first mover advantage. In the two stage game, it's not clear if you want to make the offer. It depends on how large delta is. But if delta is a big number, like 0.9, you'd rather be the person receiving the offer. In the three stage game, it looks like, looks like you'd probably rather make the offer, but it's not so clear. Right? So where does it go to as we go down the path here? So it goes down towards the 10 stage game. Looks like in the 10 stage game, looks like in the 10 stage game, you probably still prefer to make the offer than not, but they're certainly much closer together than they were before. Some of that initial bargaining power has been washed out by the fact there are 10 stages. All right. So let's try and push this just a little bit harder. What is the, instead of looking at the 10th stage offer, what if we look at the infinite stage offer. So what if, the, what if in, in, principle, in principle, we look at the infinite stage of this game? All right? So I can make you an offer, you can say no and make me an offer, and then I can reject and make you an offer, and then you can reject and make me an offer, and so on and so forth. All right? So we look at this term, if, there's, if in principle you can make an infinite number of offers. All right? So what's this term gonna look like if I can make an infinite number of offers? So I claim it's going to look like this. 1 minus delta to the infinity over 1 plus delta. And over here, at least it's going to converge towards this. It'll be a bit more formal. And over here, we'll have delta plus delta to the infinity over 1 plus delta. However, now I, can get, now I get a little bit simpler. What is delta to the infinity? It's zero, right? So 0 0.9 times 0 0.9 times 0.9 times 0.9 times 0.9 times 0.9 .9 .9 is zero. So this last term disappears, as does this one, and we just get one over one plus delta. And delta over one plus delta. So if we, make inf if we make alternating offer bargaining, a bargaining game when each round I make you an offer, you can accept it or you can reject and make me an offer. And we imagine there's no bound to this game, it just goes on arbitrarily long. Then our prediction is that player one, the person who makes the first offer, will get one over one plus delta of the initial pi and player two will get delta over one plus delta of the initial pi. Let's try and get a handle about what those numbers are. All right? So if you imagine these offers can be made fairly rapidly, right? for example, I can make an offer today, you can make an offer back to me in half an hour's time, and then I can make an offer back to you in half an hour's time, then it's reasonable to assume that the pi is not shrinking very fast. Right? The, the discount factor is not a big deal here. All right? So if these offers can be made in rapid succession, then we might think that delta itself is approximately one. The pi isn't shrinking very fast. If delta is approximately one, right, if we take delta to one here, I don't believe that the, the time isn't that valuable given how rapidly we can make offers to and fro, then what does this make this, this equal? In the case where delta is equal to one, what do we get? We get a half, which means this will also be a half. So we learn something from this, which is kind of surprising. If you do alternating offers, the sort of standard, very natural game of bargaining, sort of the kind of bargaining you might do in the bazaar in a market, or the kind of bargaining you might imagine going on in negotiations between baseball players or their agents and uh, teams or general managers of teams, right? which offers just go to and fro, and they go to and fro fairly rapidly. And in principle, they could make lots and lots of offers. 
in principle, what, we should, what, what this model tells us is in principle, we're going to end up with each people, with, with each side splitting whatever the pi was equally. Right? Very, very different from the ultimatum game where all the bargaining power was on the person who made the first offer. All right? All right, so what are the lessons here? What can we conclude from this? We've looked at alternating offer bargaining. And we've concluded, under, under special conditions, we've concluded that you get an even split. Right? You get an even share an even split, 50-50 split, if three things are true. The first thing is there are, there's potentially infinite many offers, potentially, potentially can bargain forever. And If discounting is not a big deal, what does discounting really not being a big deal means? It means those offers can be made in rapid succession. All right, so no discounting. Dis no discounting, or if you like, rapid offers. If you had to wait a year between every offer, then that discount factor would be a big deal. But I actually made a third assumption, and I made it without telling you. What was the third assumption I made? I snuck a third assumption past you without telling you. What was that third assumption? Let me get the, the mic again. So I claim I snuck a third assumption. There was somebody, well, let, me, let me start over here. What was the third assumption? Uh, I don't know if this is really important, but they know how big the pie is. They know how big the pie is. That's true. That's a big deal, actually. It's true, but there's something else going on here. What else is going on? Uh, we assumed that both players were rational. We assumed that, that's true, but we was, that's, we've kind of been assuming that throughout backward induction. You're right, this, n none of this backward induction would apply so cleanly if we didn't assume that. What else did I assume? <coughs> it's hidden, actually. I snuck it in. Uh, discount factor is a constant? We assume the discount factor is a constant. That's true, but not just constant, but something else. You're on the right lines. They're the same, right? I've assumed here, implicitly, I've assumed that both people are equally impatient. They have the same discount factor. The same discount factor, delta 1 equals delta 2. Right. Why does that matter? Well, let's just think about it intuitively a second. Suppose that one of these players is very, very impatient. They need the money now. If it's cake, they need the cake now. Right? They're very impatient. And the other person is very patient. Right? They can wait forever to get this bargain to come across. Right? Who do you think is going to do better, the patient player or the impatient player? The patient player is going to do better. Right? The patient player is going to do better. Uh, the, the, the way we ended up, the way we did all this analysis is we assumed that those discount factors were the same. We assumed that each person was discounting time at the same rate, perhaps because they were facing the same bank with the same interest rate. But in practice, often one side is going to be in a hurry to get the dispute resolved, and the other side can sit around forever. Right? And in that world, the side who can sit around forever is going to do much better. All right? Now we're going to look at relaxing this assumption, and this assumption in particular, we're going to relax it on a homework exercise. All right, so in your homework exercise, you're going to try redoing part of this analysis, good practice anyway, but doing it in a setting where the, where the discount factors are different. All right. So one thing we learned here was, yes, you get an even split, but it depends, it depends on these three assumptions. All right. And it's kind of important because when you, when you think about bargaining, I think a lot of people simply assume intuitively that wh whatever the bargain is about, people will eventually split in the middle. When you're bargaining about a house and what price you're going to pay for a house, all these things, you kind of implicitly have this assumption that you're going to end up splitting the difference. 
What I'm arguing here is you will split the difference in this natural bargaining game, but only under very special assumptions. And in particular, the assumption of patience is crucial. All right. All right. There's another remarkable thing here, though. It's also hidden. So not only do we end up with an even split, but something else remarkable happened in this bargaining game. What was the other thing, somewhat amazingly, un very unrealistic thing that occurred in this bargaining game? Let's see if we can spot it. So one thing was an assumption I made, and the other is actually a prediction. Yeah? So the first offer will be the offer that's accepted? Good. Good. Did everyone see that? So in this bargaining game, I set it up as alternating offer bargaining. So the image you had in your mind was of haggling. I made an offer. You guys thought about this offer. Shall I take this offer? Maybe I won't take this offer. You made me an offer back to me, and we kind of haggled to and fro. But actually, in the equilibrium of the game, none of that happened. That all happened in our minds. We thought about what offer we would make, and we thought about what offer you would make back to me if I made you this offer and you rejected it, and so on. We did this backward induction exercise, but it was all in our heads. Right? In, this, in this game, the actual prediction is the very first offer is accepted very first offer is accepted. There's no haggling. There's no bargaining. All right? Now, that doesn't seem very realistic. All right? There's no haggling. Backward induction suggests that we should never see bargaining. But you never see the actual process of bargaining. What we should see is an offer's made, and it's accepted. Now, what is it about the real world that allows for haggling to take place? Right, so if, this, if, if, this was the, if this was a model of the real world and we believe in backward induction, then we're done. So why is it, in fact, in the real world, we see people, see people make offers to and fro? What's different about the real world than this model? Right, let's talk about it a bit. How many of you, have, you, you must have all bargained for something in the real world. None, none of you probably bargained for a house yet, but you might have bargained for a car or something. Right? And in the, in the real world, you make offers go to and fro, right? What's going on? Why are we getting offer, offers in the real world, whereas we don't in this game? What are we missing? Yeah, let's, let's, uh, let's try up here. Uh, in the real world, you don't actually know what the other person's discount factor is. Therefore, you have uncertainty as to what your highest possible uh, offer can be. Good, good. So in the real world, unlike the model on the board, not only are those discount factors different, but you probably don't know how patient or impatient the other side is. You can get some ideas about how patient or impatient the other side is by looking at, other, uh, looking at their characteristics, for example. For example, if you know that the person you're bargaining with over their car, you're trying to buy their car, and they're a graduate student who's just got a job in uh, I don't know, Uzbekistan or something, and they ain't going to be taking their car with them, and they're leaving next week, you know, you know they're in a hurry. All right? So there's times when you're going to know something about what other people's discount factor is, how patient they are, but lots of times you're not going to know. All right? So one thing is, you just don't know what the discount factor is. By the way, what else might you not know about the other side? What else might you not know? How big the surplus is that you're splitting. Good. You might not know this good that you're selling. You might not know. You know we've been talking about there being one pie which you're carving up, and everyone knows the size of the pie. Right? But in the real world, I might not know that this, uh, this, this, this object that's being sold, I might not know how much this object is worth to the other side. And he or she may not know how much it's worth to me. Right? So that, that lack of information. That lack of information is going to change the game considerably. In particular, I might want to turn down some offers in this game in order to appear like a patient person. Or I might want to turn down some offers in the game in order to appear like somebody who doesn't really value this all very much. All right? And in so doing, I'm going to try and get you to make me a better offer. All right? So in, what's going on in haggling and bargaining, bargaining, according to this model, what's missing in this model, is the idea that you don't know who it is you're bargaining with. You don't know how much they value the objects in question. You don't <coughs> know how impatient they are to get away with the cash. All right? 
So it's a big assumption here, it's a very big assumption, is that everything is known. Right? So both, the di both, disc both patients, things, uh, both the size of the pie, or let's, let's call it the value of the pie, the value of the pi and the value of time is assumed to be known. But in the real world, you typically don't know the value of the pi of the other side, and you typically don't know how much they value time. All right, so that produces a whole literature on bargaining, none of which we really have time to do in this class. It's a pity, because bargaining is kind of important. So instead, I want to spend the last five minutes just introducing, uh, well, is it really worth introducing a new topic in the last five minutes? Um, no, I don't think it is. Let me talk a little bit more about bargaining rather than that. All right. So what does this suggest? Right? What does this suggest if we're going out in the real world? All right, actually taking this to, uh, taking this to reality. Right? So one thing it suggests is people for whom it's known that they're going to be impatient. People for whom it's known that they desperately need this deal to go through are going to do less well in bargains. Right? We already know people may do less well in bargaining because they're less sophisticated players. But here, it isn't that they're less sophisticated. They can be as sophisticated as you like, but they're just going to be in a, in a hurry. Right? We already talked about the graduate student who's leaving for Uzbekistan. Right? But who else typically in bargaining is going to need, need cash now? Who else is going to be in a weaker position when they're bargaining, just socially in, in, in our society? I'm going to try and get this get questions out of here. Yeah. In labor management uh, disputes labor? So that's a good question, right? It's a good question in labor management disputes. There's one going on right now in Hollywood. It's not clear there, right? It could be. It could be the, it could be the management side who's in a hurry because they just need right now to get uh, you know, um, David, Adam and, uh, David, David Adam and script written. Right? That, would, that would tend to favor labor. But it could be the labor side. Why might it be the labor side? So uh, did everyone know this? There's, there's, there's a writer's strike going on in Hollywood right now. All right, so the people on the management side who are in the weakest position are the people who are in the most hurry to get this resolved, and those are guys with the fewest scripts in the pipeline, and that tends to be late-night TV shows. So those guys really want this thing settled fast. They're in a weak bargaining position. On the other hand, there may be a reason why Labor's in a weak bargaining position. Why might Labor be in a weak bargaining position relative to management? Right, they have rents to pay. They, they, have, they have immediate demands on their cash. Right, T your typical worker is typically poorer than your typical manager. Not always, but typically. All right, and they just have to they have to pay the rent. They have to feed they have to feed their children. All right, so there's a more general idea there. More generally, in bargaining, the people who are poorer typically will have. This isn't just poor in terms of income. It's poorer in terms of wealth. Are going to have are going to be more impatient to get things resolved. And that's going to put them in a weaker bargaining position. In a second. So in bilateral bargaining, right, having low wealth and being known to have low wealth puts you in a weaker position. And that means that typically, people who are poorer are going to do less well, although the late night TV show may be an exception. All right. All right. It makes you think a little bit about whether uh, just setting up a bargaining position makes things equal for everybody. Any other thoughts about who has strength and who has weakness in bargaining? What other, what other kind of stunts do we see people do in bargaining? What else is kind of missing here that we need to think about? If we're, you know, what we want to do in this class is develop these ideas and take them to the real world. So what other real world, uh, real world things here are kind of missing? Yeah? Usually people will make their first offer a lot higher than what they're actually willing to accept. Right, so typically, typically you're right, typically people come, the, the, typically, bargaining isn't just a series of random numbers. Typically, people start out high, and then they concede towards the middle. Is that right? So if, if, I, if I'm the buyer, I start out with a low price and come up. And if you're the seller, you start off with a high price and come down. All right? So again, that seems to be about uh, establishing reputation and trying to indicate how much I want this good. All right? There's a, 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 something worth saying here, which we haven't got time to do in this class, and I hope you'll have time to take if you take the follow-up class, 156. We can actually show, formally, that in a setting in which buyers and sellers are bargaining, and buyers and sellers do not know how much the, the good is worth to the buyer or how much it costs to the seller, 
typically you cannot expect to get efficiency. I'm going to say that again. Right? So it's kind of an important economic fact that we're, that's missing from 115 and unfortunately missing from this class. But if we go to a more real world setting in which people's values are not known, not only are the offers not accepted immediately, and not only is there some inequity in that the poor tend to be more impatient and do less well, but also you get, you get bad inefficiency. And the inefficiency occurs essentially because the sellers want to seem like they're hard and the, and the buyers want to seem like they're hard and you get a failure, to, you, you, you get a failure for, for deals to be made. All right? So some deals are actually going to be lost or take a long time in coming. You're going to get some strikes before the deals occur and that's all inefficient. All right? So bargaining, not in this model, but in the real world, tends to lead to inefficiency. So I'll leave it there. We'll have an early-ish lunch since we're all starving because of the clock change anyway. <laughs>